The cooling system of all engines has a bunch of not very successful pipes and a weak expansion tank. The quality of antifreeze and the condition of all elements must be monitored in both. Branded services do not hesitate to change components for new ones, even on machines of the latest releases. On compressor motors, the cooling system is extremely complicated by an additional box oil cooling circuit and a liquid intercooler system with a separate circuit. The layout of the engine compartment and atmospheric versions is free, but this does not greatly reduce the cost of maintenance. Gasoline engines are old friends. The 3-liter AJ30S are well known from the X-Type and S-Type and are a very popular option on the XF. The V8 engines of the AJ33 and AJ34S series on the X350 were available in 3.5 liter, 258 horsepower, atmospheric 4.2 liter, 300 horsepower, and compressor 4.2, 420 horsepower versions. 3 liters is a very good choice in every sense. The AJ30 series is the closest relatives of the Ford Mazda of V6 2.5 to 3.0, but with some important differences that make them, by and large, not interchangeable. The AJ30 has phase shifters on the intake shaft, no hydraulic lifters and a proprietary cylinder head, a very special intake manifold and attachment. There is interchangeability for the piston group, liners and crankshaft, but for the rest the British made a bunch of minor improvements from the block mounting holes to the thread diameters. In general, this did not make the motor worse, but more expensive to operate, for sure. The weak point is essentially the same, an unsuccessful block of the lower intake manifold with geometry dampers. Seals there require regular replacement, and the dampers themselves are capricious. There are minor complaints about cap leaks, capricious VKG, all this is inherited from Ford engines and is easily solved. Due to problems with the collector, the engine eats excess gasoline and greatly lacks power. But by the standards of Jaguar, the cost of repairs is small, and it is not difficult to carry out work on a longitudinal motor. The naturally aspirated 3.5 and 4.2 AJ33 series are the most reliable engines in the line. If the pipes of the cooling system were better, especially the plastic elements in the front, and the change would go confidently over 250,000, then various Japanese UZs would hang themselves with envy. Lots of thrust, low consumption, excellent sound. This series is already with cast iron sleeves, without phase regulators, without hydraulic compensators, with conventional distributed injection. In general, the motor is as simple and logical as possible, Basically, you need to check the engines for leaks, including heat exchangers, the patency of the oil and antifreeze heat exchanger, pump leaks, the condition of the wiring, and the performance of the VCG. The timing chain does not like high temperatures very much. The chains are reliable, but the dampers easily eat away. Look carefully for signs of overheating. Otherwise, not only an oil burner can happen, but also leaks from under the cylinder head gasket, and the heads themselves lead well. If you see paranite gaskets and traces of replacement work, count on serious work with the plane of the block and cylinder head. Compressor motors of the AJ34S series differ primarily in the presence of inlet phase regulators and, in fact, the compressor, which adds to the hassle with control and cooling systems. The compressor itself is as reliable as possible, only the clutch in its drive is a consumable, and after 200,000 mileage it would be nice to check the bearings of the unit for backlash. But the cooling system is not only more complicated, it also receives such vulnerabilities as heat exchangers on each of the cylinder heads and a second electric pump. The quality of the latter, by the way, is very low, replacement with a regular Bosch with a replacement connector is highly recommended. The resource of the basic version of the engine is quite good, with runs over 300,000, the motors have often not yet been opened. But tuning and failures of the control system can finish anything. However, with fanatical maintenance, the risks are minimal. However, engines almost always require specialized service, many small risks are not obvious, the motor needs caring and careful hands. The 2.7 diesel engine has been considered in detail several times already. Its analysis can be found in the article about the Jaguar XF. 
In short, this is a good motor with one critical drawback, it folds liners due to low oil pressure. The original oil pump was replaced during the recall campaign, but the new one still does not cope. Tuning oil pumps are not of high quality, and there are risks of poor quality work. But filling in SAE 60 oil and completely changing the oil cooling system for this engine is useful. In the latter case, if the oil is not warmed up above 60 degrees, even a standard SAE 30 can be dispensed with. The only pity is that installing a separate oil cooler with a thermostat instead of a standard heat exchanger and oil pressure sensor on the dashboard is too difficult for most owners. The braking system does not present any special surprises. Atmospheric versions of cars before restyling are equipped with rather modest front brake discs with a diameter of 320 or 326 millimeters. Supercharged cars rely on quite solid 365 millimeters for pre-styling and 355 millimeters after. Yes, that's right, the new cars have more modest discs, they were unified with the Ford line of brake mechanisms on other models. And wheels with a diameter of 365 millimeters were used only on the top end S type and compressor X350 358. The only positive is that 18 inch wheels fit on 355 millimeters brakes, but no longer on 365 millimeters ones. As for the calipers, everything is simple, even in front there are always conventional mechanisms with a floating bracket, and until 2008 the calipers are two-piston, and after that they are single-piston. This did not affect the efficiency of work, nor the reliability, but the resource of the pads, according to some owners, is slightly longer for two-piston ones. But this has dramatically reduced the prices for consumables in the original version. But decent brands for two-piston calipers are twice as expensive as for single-piston ones. I don't think this creates a serious difference in operation, but it's an interesting fact. It is believed that 355mm discs often lead after overheating, but in actual practice of operation today such a problem is not observed. This may have applied to earlier versions of brake discs. The rear discs on pre-styling atmospheric versions were small. 288 millimeters then they were replaced with ventilated ones with a diameter of 326 millimeters for compressor versions before styling the discs were even slightly larger 330 millimeters but without ventilation this is a significant factor since the rear brakes are heavily used by the ESP system on powerful rear wheel drive cars and often overheat the caliper here is also a simple single piston ABS is quite reliable. The laying of the tubes is successful, except that they themselves are quite long. Wiring and sensors also do not bring much trouble. But the parking brake mechanisms here are implemented according to the French model. The screw mechanism in the rear wheel caliper is driven by a cable, and it is already pulled not by a lever, but by a simple gear motor. There are three weak points in this scheme. In combination with an electric drive, when it is used frequently, this appears less, but in general the system is rather capricious. It is worth thoroughly washing the caliper at least once a season. And at each MOT, check the rear for fogging and accumulation of dirt, as well as the uniformity of the tension of the cables in any way. Best of all, of course, just on the lift, checking the ease of movement of the levers on the rear caliper. Suspension can cause a lot of trouble for two reasons. The first and obvious one is non-alternative pneumatics. Including active, digitally controlled cats, the heir to the company's active hydraulic suspension. But the design itself here is quite delicate, very, by the way, similar to the suspension of the good old S-Type and XF, with an open work upper arm in the front suspension, a non-replaceable ball joint, breakup eccentrics on the upper and lower arms, and a very loaded jet thrust. The only improvement is that the ball joint in the XJ suspension works in compression due to a different trunnion design. In the rear suspension, the upper arm also changes from the ball assembly, but in general the suspension is more solid. However, the most unpleasant surprise was still in store in the front suspension. The lower ball joint is pressed into the trunnion and is nominally non-replaceable. In practice, there is even an original replacement part, but the landing method was chosen unsuccessfully the usual press. 
Adherents of originality tell how important the ball joint is and why it is necessary to change it only when assembled with the trunnion. But here is just the case when designers can be suspected of deliberately creating a large disposable element in order to increase the cost of operation. Unsurprisingly, a ream trunnion for a Renault slash BMW slash PSA threaded ball is a fairly common tuning for the XF and XJ X350. The price of original parts generally made one wince last year, but now it seems prohibitive about 500000 for the original set of levers for only one axle. This is not counting another 7000 for replaceable bolts and nuts. The price of a non-original also bites, and the quality of the same non-original limiter for Jaguar is very much criticized. It is good that in the lower levers all where elements can be repressed if the metal of the lever itself is intact. And the upper arm is restored well, since there are a lot of ball bearings for a relatively light body on the market, and the arm is quite fat. The lower reaction arm is sometimes bored out for 45mm opal floating ball joints, they are stronger and cheaper. Yes, and non-original upper arms, if you immediately insert a grease fitting or stuff more grease under the anther and put heat shrink collars on it, they can go for a long time. The finalization of the trunnion and its replacement is mentioned above, and in some places the Jaguars drill a hole in it for a grease fitting in specialized services. It is a pity that the non-original does not go without modifications, all available brands have been checked, and all have a weak ball boot. And troubleshooting a ball stud is a little tricky. As for pneumatics, it's not bad here. The cylinder is in a casing from the factory, very good quality of all pneumatic connections, simple shock absorbers and suspension struts without cats, computer active technology suspension, cars have this option, a simple version of active suspension. Well, it's a fairly obvious fact that the valve block and compressor wear out. Well, there are a lot of minor breakdowns due to souring rods of body level sensors, system wiring, and a not so successful compressor power supply system. It requires maintenance, does not like moisture and Chinese spare parts supplied with crooked hands. What is convenient, on the top of the rack you can understand which cylinder is installed. If anything, the pneumatics of Chinese clones are quite reliable, the design itself is successful, but the shock absorber lasts a year or two even on good roads. The valve block is simple and costs a penny, there is a replacement head for sale for the compressor, and the collector assembly is able to restore services involved in starters and electrics. But the very first fall on the belly in winter, and the owner usually already wants to change the pneumatics for springs. Fortunately, there is a bolt-on solution, but you can get confused and collect components from XF. And then there's CATS, with more complex shock absorbers and a bunch of raw electronics, and the system is actually inoperable from the factory. And the hubs are not very reliable, with runs up to 120,000 sometimes they need to be replaced. So, the suspension is not the strongest point of the X350. From the good points everything can be finalized and done really high quality. The car rides very nicely and sportily on springs, the XJR is compared even with the M5 in terms of the quality of reactions, but with the collective farm you can reduce the cost of ownership and dependence on original components to a minimum. The steering is simple, there is a regular power steering and rack. Unless the quality of English MBS rubber is far from even Soviet standards, and the tubes are flowing. Probably, it was necessary to write flow with a capital letter, because on machines older than 10 years, the system actively sweats with oil through all connections of aluminum and rubber tubes. It saves a quality service, which usually changes such parts on time at the first sign of a problem. There is nothing shameful in a simple re-rolling with new tubes, since sleeves are available for temperatures up to 120 degrees, or you can put Teflon, eternal ones. The rail is sensitive to the rubber profile, tapping due to wear of the side bushings on a low profile appears quite early. But knocks can be cured with a cheap overhaul, if you don't push the rod to the point of scuffing. Servotronic usually fails if the fluid is not changed on time. The cars are strictly rear-wheel drive, and the weak point here is the rear gearbox. Especially on compressor versions and simple 4.2 releases before 2005. In principle, the cast iron body is quite strong, 
but its breather is extremely unsuccessful, it clogs easily. And any overheating and a decrease in the oil level lead to squeezing out the seals. So you need to monitor the oil level and the oiliness of this unit, change the oil seals at the first bells, and clean the breather. The main pair and bearings cannot tolerate a drop in oil level. When inspecting, don't be lazy, look under the bumper. And take care of the rear CV joints and their hinges. Wise owners know that this situation was created artificially. Substitutes for these parts are presented abroad at ridiculous prices, but earlier, when parallel imports were banned, they could not be found in Russia. Now the import has been simplified, but the market for these parts has still remained miserable, and the logistics have become more complicated, so the shortage remains. The car was equipped only with automatic transmissions manufactured by ZF6HP series of the first generation. More precisely, it is 6HP26 on almost all versions, except for 3-liter ones, on which 6HP19 was usually installed if the option operation with a trailer was not selected. In general, this is a well-known and fairly reliable transmission, but there are nuances that need to be remembered. First of all, it must be borne in mind that, due to the characteristics of the torque converter, the oil is constantly contaminated. Regular high temperature kills this box very effectively due to the presence of rubber accumulators and very finely tuned solenoids, as well as overheating of the electronics that are inside. A detailed review of the transmission is in the article about the Jaguar XF, so we will limit ourselves to the recommendation to change the oil more often, pour in any one approved by ZF, and not run to repair the automatic transmission when shifting jerkily from first to second and from second to third. In most cases, this is a purely programmatic moment with adaptations due to the wear of the DMRV motors and failures of the VKG system in the winter. All exterior panels are aluminum, and the factory paint quality is something Audi would envy. In addition, the technology using only aluminum profiles and fasteners allows you to forget about aluminum corrosion. A little chromium and the difference in alloys do not affect it. The body does not rot if there is no contact with the ground, even if the cavities are clogged with dirt and the car has been standing under a tree for a long time. Chrome becomes cloudy, moss spoils handles and moldings, but the body is intact, no gray oxides. True, problems can happen due to unsuccessful repairs, but unfortunately, this is the price for the possibilities of aluminum. Typical small chips on the edges of the doors, scratches on the hood, sandblasting on the arches are usually removed without completely cleaning the parts, and the factory sandwich of coatings remains intact. But when the body is completely painted under the thickness gauge or when new parts are installed, the paint peels off in layers. Yes, and some services are trying to set the price for work with paintwork five times higher than the market average, citing the high cost of materials. This is usually not true materials for working with aluminum are really more expensive and there are more technological operations, but against the background of the considerable cost of body repairs, this is almost not noticeable. Especially with partial painting, when there is no work with primary soils and preparation of the metal surface. In addition, since minor dents have been repaired without painting, it has become a little easier to maintain an aluminum body. On the X350-358, the build quality of the body is simply amazingly high for the brand, very even in small gaps, so any deviations from the factory are signs of repair. Small chips of the paintwork at the door handles, above the saber of the trunk lid, around the gills, at the bumpers happen. It's not scary, you just need to wash these places better, and if possible, repair the element. Specific aerodynamics, unfortunately, creates the prerequisites for numerous chips on the front and on the bottom of the doors with frequent movement at high speeds. But the paintwork is very thick, and often the owners get around the problem with polishing and a new layer of varnish. In this case, the color may float a little when working with multi-layer coatings, polishing errors manifest themselves in this way. There are usually no special problems below. Part of the bottom is covered with plastic panels, the sills also have plastic shells, they didn't skimp on the lockers. So the aluminum from below does not suffer much more than from above. The risk zone is mainly not the body itself, but numerous pipes of the cooling systems, air conditioning, automatic transmission, brake system, and thin mounting brackets. 
The subframes, despite the presence of steel bolts and silent blocks with steel bushings, are not subject to corrosion, rather, the low ground clearance and impacts affect them. Cracks in subframes are common among careless drivers. Long overhangs usually result in damage to decorative and aerodynamic elements and the rear part of the exhaust system. It is worth taking a closer look at the attachment points of the subframes. If traces of gray powder, a product of aluminum corrosion, are noticeable, then there is a chance that the attachments will be damaged. Also, pay more attention to the installation point of the cardan outboard bearing. The rivets are rather weak. And in general, look at the condition of the rivets and connections of the power elements. Especially on early cars, cracking of the adhesive layer occurs and a gradual violation of the geometry of the body. If the rivets are loose or there is corrosion in the joints, then the body should be shown to professionals who will carefully check it all. Jaguar has always prioritized style over practicality, and this XJ is no exception. There are a lot of small decorative elements, and their condition must be monitored, including because they are not always humane. In a neglected car, you can invest half a million just for moldings to make it look its best. Compact headlights lose a lot of luminosity if the glass is worn out or the lens is burnt out. Recovery is a little more difficult than usual, but possible. Aluminum door hinges and locks do not like rough treatment, they require regular maintenance, and no copper lubricant. For aluminum this is death, and the inside of the door is a bit soft, it's not worth hitting debtors with the door, like in the movie Snatch. Even a seatbelt buckle caught in the gap between the door and the body can cause trouble. The classic Jaguar problem in the form of locking motors has not escaped this car, sometimes they will have to be changed. Stylish door handles can be broken, and the chrome coating does not like the Moscow climate. It is better to open the trunk lid carefully if you do not have an electric drive. The drive mirrors must be sorted out every three years if you do not want breakdowns. The outer lining of the mirrors is delicate, with clips. The pins on the inner trunk lining are rather weak, and the inner trunk handle is not attached to the metal of the lid, so the lining is torn off and the edges of the door cards often hang out. The windshield wears out relatively early, and in general, the factory one is very soft, and replacement is not the easiest. If you don't want to glue the moldings with sealant, then you need to act carefully and according to the instructions. The transition to Ford cable window lifters freed the car from the specific problems of lever structures half a century ago, but the cables do not last forever, and the work requires in some places the skill of an octopus and patience about the ease of assembly and disassembly obviously didn't care. At the same time, the quality of the cables, buttons and clips is rather forward. This is not bad when compared with what it was before the 2000s, but in comparison with the German Troika, the difference in class is obvious. Dealer service solves the problem, but be prepared for the fact that maintaining the car in perfect order is noticeably more expensive than German brands. And even at a very advanced age, she crumbles a little bit. The quality of the English interior is the second reason, after the general style, why the future owner shells out a fat cutlet of money for a not-so-practical car. He usually finds out about interesting handling later, if he finds out at all. The sound of motors is also usually not the main reason. But the ergonomics and quality of English interiors are something that is easy to fall for. This is not to say that there is not an ounce of savings here, grills made of not very expensive and easily scratched plastic can cause dissonance, and if you look closely, some buttons also do not fit into the style. But overall, the interior is great. I will not even criticize the quality of the coloring of beautiful skin, especially if it is light, and talk about the imperfection of the onboard multimedia system. All this is not very important. Just remember, there is often a place to put your hands on the little things, everything is done well, but sometimes it works only with regular maintenance by special handy people. If you are a perfectionist, and the crackling of the interior annoys you a lot, then this car is not very suitable for you. Yes, and from the point of view of structural noise of the body, aluminum conducts sound well and does not dampen it, there are some difficulties, the first experience with aluminum body was not without surprises. 
There are two problems in the climate control, a regularly dying stove speed controller and rotting pipes on the stove, and the radiator is not very strong. The British hardly understood that in Russia antifreeze in cars is almost never changed, so I would not attribute this to the disadvantages of the car. Pedantic owners are aware of the peculiarity and try to change it more often and only for high quality ones. But if the car is from under the rider and something incomprehensible splashes in the expansion tank, then problems are very likely. It is worth paying attention to traces of drips on the ceiling and center console if the car has a sunroof. The British put a hatch with a steel bathtub in the aluminum body and it rots to the point of holes. And the drains get clogged regularly. Remember how the wiring to the Ziguli was arranged? Jaguars used to have exactly the same wiring, with bolt-on contacts, thick harnesses, but with a touch of high-tech in the form of digital buses. In this generation, the heritage began to get rid of. Almost everywhere everything is done in a modern way, with compact pads, but insufficient sealing, with thin and neat wiring harnesses of precisely calculated length, all on modern tires. And there was no optical. But in some places there are still classic power wiring blocks and non-standard connectors, for example, in the engine compartment and under the instrument panel. In general, this has little effect on reliability, but it suggests that this car was literally born at the turn of eras. And unfortunately, traditionally for the brand, small surprises are possible. Failures of suspension position sensors, light sensor, automatic transmission selector, fuel pump. And the complexity of maintenance, it seems, was not thought at all. So, the banal replacement of backlight or lighting usually requires the work of a professional fitter, and not for 15 minutes. This is not to say that the electrical part of the machine is unreliable. Everything is quite standard and strong. But a few breakdowns are expensive due to the presence of non-standard elements and the high price of spare parts for the brand. And the abundance of different systems creates a good chance for unforeseen expenses on 20-year-old machines. <laughs>